It is November 12, 2003. My name is Sean Jackson. My partner Anthony Kosher and I will be interviewing Mr. Shillow, a World War II Army veteran. Okay. When did your uh, outfit go to go to the Philippines? What, what year was that? Well, we were on the island of New Guinea for a total of 30 months, right to the day. I had uh, one seven-day furlough back in Australia in that period. We, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit of the story. We, told, we, we were told we were going to be moving, we were going to move up the coast of uh, 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 New Guinea from where we were at Lay. Incidentally, Lay, L-A-E, was the last port of call for Amelia Earhart when she was flying around the world. That was the last time she was seen alive. And that was, became quite an installation for the Japanese. But we were going to go to Finchhaven and prepare for a move to the Philippines. And while we were at Lay, we were given new equipment, a 40 millimeter gun that would be airborne. Uh, they were thinking ahead. They knew that the move would have to be made to Japan sometime or other. And this was a 40 millimeter gun that could be broken down into pieces and put on a plane and taken off. Uh, We had some C-47 wrecks that were propped up in a flying position and we would practice loading and unloading that gun. Well, the big thing was unloading it because you would be coming down into a combat zone. You had to get that baby down and into action. And I was quite proud of the fact that at that time I was a gun sergeant, three-striper. We could unload that thing and have it ready to fire in 13 seconds. A 40 millimeter machine gun? No, 40 millimeter cannon. Can oh, goodness. <laughs> Fires, it's a rapid firing cannon. 40 millimeters is the size of the diameter of the shell, about mm -hmm. so big. And uh, it fires. Two shots a minute, 120, uh, two shots a second, 220 a minute. Shots, yeah. The terrible, most horrible noise you can imagine. And we had no air protection. It's a crack, 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 crack. <laughs> and I like to attribute my, my bad knees to the fact that we were jumping out of that plane. It wasn't too bad when we were just jumping out. But then we started doing it with full packs. And uh, Probably jumping down close to five feet. Oh gosh. Sixty pound packs, five feet. Oh. Uh, <sighs> yes, all right, I forgot what was the I just asked you uh, when did you find out your outfit was going to the Philippines? Yeah. Well like what year you're, you're you're practicing, you know, that's the next step. Yeah. From there we knew the next one was gonna be into Japan. Mm. It was just foregone conclusion. I personally never dwelled on it, but I never expected to go back to the States. I knew I was going to leave my bones in uh, some place over there. So this was about, what, 1945, 44-ish? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, where, when you made it to the Philippines, where were you stationed? Where did they station you? Because you figured you were moving on to Japan. We were on the first landing ship to go into Manila, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, they moved us out to, I think it was Clark Field, where we staged before the next position. And uh, somehow or other, I got word that if I could get a hold of a water tanker, that's the 
trailer, trailer uh, water tank that holds 500 gallons, that uh, I could make a visit to the San Miguel Brewery. Oh, I told them, the mess sergeant, I got to have the trailer. Don't ask any questions. That was our way of doing things. Nobody got involved except the guy doing it. I told somebody else, I had to have a Jeep. Now, don't ask questions. Got the Jeep, got the trailer, went to the San Miguel Brewery, <laughs> pulled into this area and they put a fire hose in the top of that sucker. I came back, I went up to the first side and I said, Sergeant, fall in the battery with mess cups. <laughs> and I stood beside the spigot and if anybody could have gotten or had the ability to award a medal that day, I would have got it. I was a hero. <laughs> Besides filling up trucks with beer, <laughs> what, what were you? You were mainly anti-aircraft in the yeah. Philippines, right? You were protecting the airfields. Okay, that's so. Um, did you face any uh, combat or near combat situations while you were in the Philippines? Yes. Japanese. While we were anti-aircraft, at that time, the Japanese Air Force was practically non-existent. Mm -hmm. But they damn sure had a good army. They moved us to the town of Pasig, S-P-A-S-I-G, on the Pasig River, which is a heck of a good-sized stream. That flows right through the city of Manila, mm -hmm. divides Manila into two parts. Uh, just downstream from us was a pontoon bridge. And we were set up on an old bridge abutment. The bridge had disappeared. I don't know what happened to that. And we were to guard that pontoon bridge from anything coming down river. The Japanese supposedly, the story we were given was they had a cavalry unit about 20 minutes from where we were. Well, we had just the ideal gun for that. And the backup for our 40 millimeter was what we called a quad 50. Four 50 caliber machine guns with one operator. It could do an awful lot of damage. And the the turret that he sat in was semi-armored. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were a very, very potent force, even though we were just one gun section of when we were full strength, 15 men. Mm -hmm. But we had our tents set right up on the river. Uh, I should say that when I went on, when I first went in service as a private, you pulled guard duty just about all the time, every night. Corporal yeah, still had to pull guard duty because we were losing people along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got to be sergeant, I was still pulling guard duty. And this one night, in the middle of the night, the People in the Philippines would make huge dugout canoes called bankas. I don't know how to spell it. And I'm sitting on the riverbank. I have my M1. I have a clip in the M1. Eight tracers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to direct fire if we have a target. It's a little bit hairy because you draw a line from the target back to you yeah. when you fire a tracer. I've got one more uh, clip stuck in the sling of my rifle. I always had the 16 shots available. All of a sudden, I look up river, and here's a banca coming towards me. You could probably get. Eh, 12, 15 people in one with no, no problem. And it keeps coming. Mm 
and it's coming. Oh, good. <coughs> what am I going to do? I'm down close to the water. I can see this thing. And there's another guard up on the quad 50. He can't see it. He's up above looking down. The light was such that he didn't know. This is a good sized river. It's about a couple hundred feet across this place, this area. That thing keeps coming and keeps coming. And finally, just before it hits shore, I challenged. Halt, who goes there? No answer. Mm -hmm. I start firing. I'm drawing a line from the boat to me. I'm rolling all the time. I don't want anything coming back. <laughs> the thing finally stabs the shore, and all my guys out of the tents are all around, everything's on. The uh, 30 caliber machine guns that the engineers have down at the pontoon bridge, they're alerted, they're ready. I think they fired off a few bursts just for to help out. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anybody in that damn boat. <laughs> the thing had broken loose up above and the current had brought it down and for some unknown reason got that to come in towards me and right at our tent area. <sighs> there are scary times and scary times and sometimes it turns out to be nothing. Thank God. <laughs> Man, it's close call. Oh yeah. yeah. So what, what, the well, what happens lots of times in situations like that, there's a lot of friendly fire. Yeah, I was worried about those two 30 caliber machine guns at that bridge. Fortunately, one of them just fired. If they both would have fired, they just encourage each other then yeah. to keep going. Yeah. <sighs> were there still uh, some Japanese left? They were hiding on the island, some, you know. The what? Some of the Japanese army was still left on the Philippines island. Oh, God, yes. Um, weren't you, weren't you afraid of being attacked? Or, obviously, I mean, did... Uh, after I made platoon sighted, well, we left the uh, Pasig area and moved back into, the, into Manila. Uh, and we had guns strategically located all around Manila. And I would go from, as a platoon sergeant, I had four guns that I was responsible for. And I would visit each gun every day, check on their needs, make sure that everything was okay, if they had a replacement coming in, bring the new man in. And just to see what was going on, because there had been a lot of trouble in the bars and so forth. We, the bars in Manila. Yeah, but... Our sailors and oh, soldiers yeah. were... Uh, Do get out. Get involved. They wanted no weapons. You could not carry a weapon. Well, that's... In a way it's good, in a way it's bad. I visited one of my gun sections one night which was located in Fort Santiago. This was a, really a barracks type thing. They were, uh, I guess they were brick, brick or stone buildings with orange tile roofs. Uh, and it was located just about in the center of uh, Manila very close to the Pasig River, literally across the street from the uh, huge Catholic cathedral, which ships, when they came into the harbor, would calibrate their compasses on the cross. That was a known latitude and longitude, and you could mm -hmm. do your thing. But this one particular night, I drove in in my Jeep, and I look around and everybody's hiding. What the hell's going on? There's a sniper up there on the roof shooting at us. What? Shooting at my number three gun section? That's 
You don't do that. About that time, one shot came by me. Ooh. I can't remember how I got there, but I got on the roof. I'm after this guy. I've got a pocket knife. And I'm after him. We've run from one building to another along the ridges. Every now and then a tile would slip out. I don't know how I didn't kill myself. Fortunately for me, I did not catch this guy. Because he was armed and I just had my pocket knife. Oh You're just so mad you just had to chase him. Nothing <laughs> would stop me. I just ran out of roof, that's all. I don't know where he went to. Um, hmm. See, Manila Harbor at that time was literally full of sunken Jap ships. They were sitting on the bottom, but these mm -hmm. upper structures were habitable. And those guys would come in at night and snipe. Pick off soldiers. And yeah, yeah, yeah. All night long. How'd you get them out of there? Just gradually whittle them down. Yeah. You didn't want to go on those ships. It, it wasn't worth the, the loss of life that you would experience. Yeah. You can bomb the Oh, no, they wouldn't bother doing that. That's the yeah, waste of the material. They had been bombed to sink them. And, uh, yeah. and you could never convince any of the authorities that that was a problem. It was only a problem if you had a job to do close to the, the shoreline. <laughs> when, when did the Army decide to discharge you, or send you home, send you back home? Uh, they came out with a point system. You got so many points for your length of service. Uh, you got so many points for different medals that you may have earned. Mm -hmm. uh, points for being in the combat area. And 85 points would get you a trip home. The lowest man in our outfit had 135 points. <laughs> It wiped out the 101st pretty much so. Yeah, like a lot of them <laughs> had a lot more points yeah. than the, the 135. How many points Up to that point, we were ready, trained to make the jump into Japan. That was the next step. Forget Okinawa. That was over with. Mm -hmm. We were going to fly in there. And don't know if our planes would have fallen out, but we would have been there. Oof. They, they said it had been some of the heaviest casualties of the war. Just getting in oh, there. Not, not to mention staying. Yeah, not to mention staying there. Just getting in there. We were looking at a million American casualties. <laughs> oh my God. And you started talking about how many of the enemy we'd kill. I have to wipe them out. So you were like very happy that you were going home before. Well, at the time you thought you were about to invade Japan. You were happy that you were going to go home finally, or were you? How did you feel about that? Really, I had no emotions. No? I had 165 points, and uh, I had a funny thing. I had. When we were training at Lay, I should have told you this earlier, mm -hmm. uh, we had this new gun and at, at night we'd go out and fire it at uh, illuminated targets. Mm -hmm. uh, like on our quad 50 when we trained on that, got to the point where my gunners were only allowed four rounds. One would be a tracer. They were so good that if you gave them any more than that, they'd blast the target out of the sky. We, we wanted to get close to it or hit it, but we didn't want to blast it. Mm -hmm. They were, uh, well, like the toy airplanes they have today. Uh, crank them up, hold them, let them go, and yeah. they'll fly around. 
radio control points. Yeah. Well, they and when the, the 40 millimeter, forget that, we were too good. Uh, in fact, my gun crew at that time, I was still a, a, a gun sergeant, was picked to be one of two honor guns on the uh, flagship of our convoy going to the Philippines. We put our guns on board, chained them down, mm -hmm. one on the starboard and one on the port side. In addition to the armament on the flagship, we were it. Man, so really efficient, really good. I worked those guys. <laughs> I worked them hard. You could lay back in, a, in your bunk or a chair and somebody was always, the, what kind of plane is that? Or how many is that? We could tell you by the sound of the engine how many there were. Not only the, what it was, but how many. And it was easy. The Jap planes had a very distinctive sound. The engines weren't synchronized. A B-25 had a certain sound, B-24, B-17, but the engines were synchronized. The Japs went up and down all the time. Where were we? Uh, I can could, I could digress here. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, I was just asking you how you felt about when the Army finally sent you home. How you felt about that? Oh. For some reason or other, my name was called. I was told to get my gear ready. I was going to fly home tomorrow. I shook hands with a few people. I, had, I didn't have a pack then, I had a musette bag, the clothes on my back, had a mess kit, and not much else. Souvenirs, a doll disappeared, well, stuff up. I don't know, carry it around for so long, then you throw it away. Yeah. Uh, I've got to come back and tell you a good souvenir story, though. Mm -hmm. uh, got on board plane, and it was a four-engine DC-5 or 7, I don't know. But there was two big aircraft engines strapped down in the middle of it. And uh, I don't know, there was only about ten of us that were on this thing. Uh, we landed at Guam just to keep pick up sandwiches or something, landed at Kwajalein. And at Kwajalein I took a, a walk on the beach and I was smoking my pipe and this guy came up. I had my pants rolled up because I'd left a muddy situation and you roll your pants, you don't want to get to the bottom of your pants muddy. I had a an altered army shirt, this uh, Filipino family, they were fantastic seamstresses. They cut the sides out of my shirt so it was, I could just button it. Not all the buttons, mm -hmm. but it was real form-fitting. <laughs> At that time, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a big guy. Yeah. Six, 135 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> My mother died when she saw me. <laughs> Nothing but ribs. I mean, I'm all bone. <laughs> well, this guy is coming towards me, and I'm smoking my pipe. And I give him a left-handed salute because I got my pipe in my yeah. mouth. <laughs> it's a Marine General. Oh, gosh. He looked at me and said, What branch of service are you in? Army, sir. Must be Cox's Army. C O X. Mm -hmm. You know who he was? He was this. Uh, That's your assignment for tonight. You look up who General Cox was. He got. He wasn't an actual general, but he was a guy. I can't remember what he did, but he ended up getting arrested. He let a bunch of disgruntled unemployed workers. I can't remember exactly what it was. Soldiers. They were supposed to get a bonus. Oh, okay. I thought it was workers. And that was in 1895 or 99 or something like that. I don't know, but it was Cox's yeah. army that marched on Washington. Yep, and he got arrested. 
Yeah. Kind of disbanded yeah. from there. Yeah. <laughs> so you were a little surprised when you found out it was a not only a Marine, I but a Marine General. I didn't care. <laughs> you didn't care? At that point, I it meant nothing. The war was over for me. You don't like me, shoot me. I. Mm. When one of the trips, or one of the stops was Hawaii. Got off the plane and they took us right into this chow line. There's a beautiful blonde. And the first thing that she hands you is a big glass of cold pineapple juice. Oh, God. Fresh pineapple juice. I had a couple of those mm -hmm. and I could go no farther. It was Jap POWs serving the rest of the meal. I could not accept food from a Japanese. Mm -hmm. Just was against me. When I got to Fort Dix to be discharged, mm -hmm. I had to fight with myself because they were German POWs. It, it, look at all these guys ahead of me. They're not dropping dead. The Germans have been serving them for God knows how long, yeah. from the time we started taking prisoners, probably. But you just have that feeling, and you can't move from a battle situation to a peaceful situation, as I did overnight, literally, and turn all those feelings off. You're geared to react, to do things. You weren't used to civilian <laughs> life yet. I mean, you weren't used oh, to... Oh, God, no. You just spent about three years in the jungle fighting. Right. And now some prisoner is serving you food and he was trying to kill you a little before. Yeah, yeah. This, okay. <laughs> Um, oh, that's my page. Uh, how did you, when you were, when you were finally home, it said in your book that you took a train back to Buffalo from Chicago? No, New York. New York? Oh, New York, okay. Yeah, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Okay. And then my buddy, who had been just discharged ahead of me, picked me up at Fort Dix and we went out for a night. But you took a train back to Buffalo? Yeah. On the, how, did the feelings hit you that you were finally home on the train? How did you...? Uh, going across New York State, I slept the first part. I had a, a full evening, believe me. Uh, sometime in the early morning, we went through Batavia and on past Attica, New York. And all of a sudden it hit me. Here was an area that I had hunted before I went in service. Here are fields that I'm now seeing that I never expected to see again. I'm crying. Literally, the tears are pouring down my cheeks. Yeah. yeah. That was a handful. So it finally hit you then. That that was it. Oh, I should tell you, I, I did have another hit. As the plane was coming in to land in San Francisco, hmm. Fort Hamilton. You were in San Francisco? Well, when I flew across, oh. I came into San Francisco. I, uh, I realized that, gee, three and a half years overseas and I'm still alive. I've made it. I was sitting next to one of the emergency doors. It was sort of a, a window, it was a small one. I had my hand on the handle. I had my other hand on the ring on my life jacket. I was going to make it. I was going, if that thing went down, I was going to be out. And I don't care how far it was, I could swim that far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the first realization. And I should tell you that we got in very early in the morning to San Francisco to the uh, Fort Hamilton, I think it was. I could be wrong in names. The memory isn't there anymore. Uh, first thing we went to a barber shop, the works. 
-hmm. Haircut, facial, mud packs, you name it. Next thing, town. We went into town, first thing, shot in the beer. Uh, where were you again now? Where were San Francisco. Okay, I thought so. Bam! I'm out like a light. I got malaria. The whiskey okay. brought that. Oh, I had malaria for years. No, but how did it? Yeah. Well, this was the alcohol. The alcohol brought it right out. Hmm. The shot. Yeah. Wait, that, that's potent stuff. Yeah. The guys got me back to camp, and never let anybody know. They answered for me in roll call, got me on the plane, and looked after me all. No way. Were they going to let me be left in some damn army hospital all by myself? We had made it this far together, we are going all the way. <laughs> there was about five or six of my unit that were looking after me. That's good. There was a, <laughs> there was a, a little story in your book about a doctor that tried to check you. And oh, came out of at Fort Dix. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, Went into a, a good-sized room. This is our final physical, discharge physical. Mm -hmm. And there's doctors at desks all the way around. There must have been 15 doctors in there. There's, there's this one little creep. I don't know how he got into the army. He was too small, but I guess the medical service was taking anything. And of course, you're stripped down. You don't have a stitch on. Mm -hmm. My body is yellow and white blotches. Yeah. Yellow from the adabrin that I've been taking for years for adabrin, for uh, malaria. And I say, my ribs, sh I look like these pictures of people coming out of the prisoner of war camps. Mm -hmm. Still 135 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and he made the remark that because you're a hell of a looking physical specimen. And there again, I didn't care. And I said, you little S-O-B, you wouldn't be alive today if you'd been where I've been for as long as I've been. And all the other doctors were, <laughs> <laughs> he must have been a son of a gun because yeah. they were so glad that somebody was telling them off. But he didn't say a word. Didn't say a word. He just said, next. He wanted no part of this boy. I didn't care. So, um, what was, what was the date of your discharge like, when they finally released you from your... I got trouble with dates. Simply because I crossed the international date line. So, uh... I think about the 15th of July, 1945. I got married, I think, on the 25th. Okay. My girlfriend was in the waves out in Idaho, yeah. and she had, uh, I had called her, I remember from, she was at Camp Farragut, and uh, I had called her from some place in, you know, it doesn't matter. Salt Lake, it's close to Salt Lake City anyway. And told her to get a pass. Come on home, we'll get married. And she had a problem getting a pass on such notice, notice mm -hmm. but that was the way for the girls to get out of service real yeah. quick was to get married. Wow, she was away? Oh, yeah. She'd, mm. she'd had enough of military service up to then, too. <laughs> um. When the, uh, where were you when the America dropped those atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Where was I? Yeah. I was home in Buffalo. Uh, that had no real impact on me. You got to remember that there was no television. Mm -hmm. We had to wait till. The Army released pictures of the mushroom. I was in downtown Buffalo at the Stadler Hotel when word came of Jap's surrender. Mm -hmm. And that was a party. That was a good deal.
But the actual bombing, I, I don't remember. I just know how relieved that nobody was going to be killed. The few that the bomb took out was, you know, it wasn't near what we killed with our fire bombs. It was about 75,000, I can't remember the exact statistics of, of the bombing. It took a lot of people, but it would have been a lot more if we had invaded on both sides. Oh, God, the hell with the other side, yeah, just our side. Alone, but by at least 10 times. So you, you were happy that they bombed the Absolutely, bomb. no question. Oh, Harry did the right thing. <laughs> um, I'll vote for him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> in, in closing, in closing, closing, we're all through. Yeah, man, I got a lot of stories to tell you. I'm getting drinking. In, uh, how do you feel the military experience changed your life? Boy, that's a curve. It was good for me. Uh, I learned discipline. Not that I was a, a bad boy or anything. It learned, it taught me how to get along with people. Uh, living under the different conditions that you do. Uh, I, if I had to do it again, I would make an effort not to form the tight, loving friendships that I made in service because it hurts when you lose them. That's, that's bad. When you hold them in your arms and lose them. I could do it again, okay. but I'd do it a little different. I'd be a so-called owner on my own. Okay. Cut. You had enough for today? Actually, you just you answered three questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um. Yeah, that's it. My name is Sean. And his name is Coach. Anthony. Okay. I have been talking to my Boy Scouts and to friends, relatives. I've been doing some work in schools. Somehow or other I got into a rut doing fourth grade schools. <laughs> the kids love it. <laughs> I have great times telling them stories. Can I tell one more story? You can tell as many as you like. Uh, Food was always a problem. Our first area, near 12 Mile, there was a prison farm. A prison? Yeah, a prison farm. The Australians would incarcerate different natives for whatever crimes mm -hmm. they had. So they would look after the fields and the crops that they grew. The bananas, which we found out about and started liberating bunches of bananas. You had to be careful. We were warned of that very early on. If the Australians heard or saw anything, they would shoot. They wouldn't bother asking questions. They didn't want to lose their food. Mm -hmm. So then we found out another part of this farm where they grew pineapples. We could sneak in at night and get some pineapples. And if you never have had a field ripened pineapple, man, you haven't lived. <laughs> they had another fruit that grew on uh, sort of low trees. It was like an orange, like a tangerine. It was a mixture in there someplace. So we'd go over there at night, have our shirts on, open our shirts so we could tuck the stuff in. We'd reach up and pull these things down and stick them in our shirt. And I reach up and I pull this limb down. It's not a limb. I have pulled a snake down on top of me. <laughs> this guy's about that big around. Mm. He's all over me. 
It's a constrictor of some sort. I'm after him. I finally get the head. I'm holding the head out. Hey, Bill, Bill, Bill. Nobody hears me. Nobody's paying any attention to me. I'm walking around this snake. The rest of them is starting to wind up around me. I'm holding the head out. And the head's uh, about that big. Oh I got him like this. Finally, the first guy that realizes I'm in trouble, he leaves. He goes, he goes <laughs> oh, oh, I, that's a real buddy. <laughs> that's the kind you need when a time of need. <laughs> Finally, they get this in. Get the tail. Grab the tail and walk around me. Well, they do. Get the thing on. Let him go. That was scary. Not the snake. I was afraid of getting shot. Mm -hmm. I was afraid I was going to have to holler for help. That I didn't want to do. You have told me some of the most interesting stories I've ever heard. Thank you for coming here today. Well, I appreciate this opportunity. I hope that sometime in the future, someplace, this can be used by people who realize, as somebody said, War as hell. It is. It's nasty. I lost out on college because of it. That was my period to go to college. Mm -hmm. And I never had... I got married. I couldn't do my college thing as a married man. I had responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But you guys have been wonderful. As I say, I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.